This episode of Out of the Trenches is sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. I'm Indy Nidell, and I'm sitting here in the chair of madness to answer all your questions about the First World War. Yes, the chair of madness here in my apartment in lovely Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, a bunch of you have written in asking to see it again, so I thought I'd shoot one of these here. And my friend Ryan is our guest cameraman today. Come say hi, Ryan. Hey. That's Ryan. Ryan, everybody. Uh, okay, I, I printed out some questions and some notes for answers, so here we go. Uh, can't find original name from Reddit, writes, In one of the previous episodes, you mentioned that the Belgian king and commander did not want to join the major attacks at the Somme and others. Other battles, I guess. How did the British command react, knowing that the violation of their neutrality was one of the big reasons Britain joined the war. Did the Belgian army perform some attacks on their own, or was their part of the line pretty quiet? Thanks a lot, it says. Well, you're welcome, uh, can't find original name from Reddit. The Belgians were not technically allied with the British or the French. King Albert I of Belgium, uh, he preferred to use the term guarantors, right? So there was not very much the British or French governments could do. Um, the British and the French did try to coerce the Belgian army to fit into their battle plans, but Albert did not budge from his belief that Belgium should fight a defensive war along the Isère front. Uh, there were hostile campaign, campaigns in the British and French press towards Belgian inactivity, but these were also ineffective. And it would have, if you think about it, uh, completely defeated the point of protecting Belgian independence, guaranteeing Belgian neutrality, if the British had forced the Belgians to bend to their will. So for propaganda purposes, their hands were completely tied. In addition to this, the Belgian army was not really in a position to launch a major advance against the Germans since they'd been really badly hurt in 1914 when they were invaded. Rebuilding that army was, well, impossible as well since most of Belgium was in German hands. Now, the Isar front itself had remained a quiet sector for the majority of the war since the Belgians couldn't really attack the Germans, and the Germans had nothing to gain tactically from attacking the Belgians there. It was only after the failure of the German spring offensives in 1918, sorry, spoiler, that the Belgian king, Albert, uh, decided to attack alongside the British and French and the Americans. On September 28, 1918 at Ypres, 12 Belgian divisions, 10 British and 6 French attacked the Germans and took 6 miles of territory. The Belgians then attacked later on the 14th of October at what would become known as the Battle of Courtrai. Uh, around 40 miles of territory was gained in 5 days and it became pretty clear that Germany had lost the war. Quintin Martins on Facebook writes, uh, Hi Andy, hi Quintin Martins. Uh, can you give us more information about the tensions between Flemish and Walloon soldiers in the Belgian army? I've read a lot of stories about how you could only become an officer if you spoke French, and about how many Flemish soldiers died because they couldn't understand the French orders. Keep up the good work. I like it when people end with things like that. It is true to say that tension did exist between Flemish and Walloon soldiers, yes. Uh, French was the language of all Belgian administration. It didn't matter if it was governmental, educational, or, or in the military. Uh, in fact, the German army saw an opportunity to exploit this tension to their advantage. They categorized Flemish citizens as oppressed people uh, in order to divide and weaken Belgium. And they set out to guarantee all of the unenforced rights of the Flemish in the Belgian constitution. This was supported by a small group of hardline Flemish activists who wished to collaborate with the Germans to promote their own goals. The Germans first split all ministries into Flemish and Walloon sections, and then, in early 1917, founded the first Flemish university at Ghent. The Flemish activists uh, themselves, they even tried to set up an autonomous Flemish government until that was stopped by the Germans. A much greater number of the Flemish, though, remained loyal to Belgium, and many fought in the Belgian army. Many Walloons, however, uh, felt betrayed by the Flemish who were seeking more autonomy and representation in Belgian life at a time when Belgian unity was more important than ever. Ram Tank from Reddit writes, While the utility of hand grenades and mortars seems obvious to us, what exactly was the thought process in taking ideas that had been considered largely or entirely obsolete for at least a hundred years and reintroducing them, especially in a military culture that seems so rigid and resistant to change. 
you have to remember that the turn of the 20th century was a time of great invention and scientific marvels, and not all of these were met with disregard by the generals. Even Kaiser Wilhelm himself, he saw the potential of the new machines in combat, especially after his personal ride on one of the new U-boats, he helped convince his generals that they could be used for attacking rather than only defense, as the British had planned. Uh, grenades themselves were actually viewed in a positive light by military commanders very early on. They were seen as a possible solution to break the stalemate, particularly on the Western Front, especially since they were effective at clearing out enemy trenches and dugouts. The British organized bomb squads, which were made up of around nine men, or exactly nine men. Uh, they consisted of two grenade throwers, two grenade carriers, two bayonet men, and two soldiers in reserve, and they were led by a non-commissioned officer. Other countries had similar, if not identical, squads, and the troops picked for these roles were usually recommended for their bravery and their capability. They were armed with pistols and bayonets for close quarter fighting. There was a lot of progress in the design of grenades during the First World War, like the invention of the Mills Bomb in 1915 by British industrialist William Mills. Now, it was famously shaped like a pineapple in order to offer the soldier a better grip on the weapon to throw it. Uh, the German Stiel Handgranate was primarily used to blow troops off their feet, not to kill them, right? But you could throw it further because it had the long handle on the bomb itself. And it was this unusual design that resulted in the British nicknaming them potato mashers. Different versions were made, including one which could be fired from the barrel of a rifle. Uh, mortars were seriously important in the Great War for destroying enemy concrete emplacements. Shells were required to fall from an extreme angle uh, in order to have any hope of destroying, say, concrete pillboxes rather than just ricocheting off. The mortar shell's steep angle of descent was also perfect for landing in an enemy trench. Now, as I said at the beginning of this episode, this episode of Out of the Trenches was sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. Now, this is a video learning service that features lectures by professors from top universities around the world, as well as experts from places like the Smithsonian or National Geographic. And for $14.99 in dollars, you can get access to all 7,000 video courses and you can learn something about pretty much any topic. Now, that last question I answered um, reminded me, reminded us, of one of the lectures we actually watched um, because a lot of ideas about modern war seem very obvious to us nowadays, but these things had to be learned many times the hard way, which is through great military blunders. And Professor Gregory S. Aldry looked at the biggest military blunders in history and what consequences they had and how they affected the future. Um, he talks about some prominent battles like, well, Gallipoli, which of course we've covered in depth, which you all know all about, of course. But he also takes a look at less explored topics like medieval Japan and the Crimean War. And it's, it's really cool, actually. You should check it out. And Christmas is approaching. And what gift is better for Christmas than the gift of history? So if you go over to the Great Course plus.com slash the great war or follow the link in the description below you can start a one month trial in which you can watch all 7,000 of those videos you might not have time to do much else but what the heck uh, you'll learn something and while you're doing that you're also supporting this show uh, if you'd like to see our special bio episode about Belgian King Albert you can click right here for that do not forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and of course subscribe see you next time